Hey all, it's Lisa Schwartz, ITSM Academy. I am so sorry about that. A technical error on my end. Uh, apologies. Jeff Rumberg with Metric with <laughs> Metric Net. Um, I'm a little flustered, sorry. Um, is here to talk to us today about metrics that matter. And Jeff, I'm gonna pass it right over to you and I'm very sorry. Hey, uh, no worries. I'm just uh, thrilled to be here uh, with you, Lisa. Uh, we've known each other for quite some time, uh, having worked in the ITSM industry for a number of years. And uh, to all of the audience members, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we're going to be talking about shift left today. Um, it's not a hypothetical concept. It's something that can actually be measured. And for those that are serious about reducing their total cost of ownership and improving the user experience, uh, shift left is a serious concept that you ought to adopt in this industry and it can be measured. That's why we're talking about metrics around uh, shift left. Now, I'm not going to be on cam the whole time. I just wanted to let you know this is a live broadcast. Uh, many of you I know, some of you I've worked with, uh, but I don't know all of you. So uh, I genuinely appreciate the time that you've spent uh, today to hear my presentation on the metrics of shift left. Okay, without further ado, we're going to jump right into our discussion here, and I'm going to introduce something called the economics of shift left. What we're showing here is the cost of resolving a ticket in 2020 in North America at different levels of support. So we start on the far right-hand side, typically vendor support, think Microsoft, think Oracle, uh, think uh, Cisco, Avaya, when you have to get a vendor involved in resolving a ticket, on average, the cost of that ticket is around $600. Now it ranges dramatically. It might only be $100, it might be several thousand dollars. But on average in North America last year, vendor resolved tickets cost about $600. Now there are field services tickets. These are when you have uh, either an outsourcer or your own personnel who have to go out into the field and touch a device, look at connectivity, do a brake fix, do a hardware replace. Those tickets are about $221 each, but once again, the range is quite wide based upon the travel time per ticket and also based upon the work time per ticket. Now, if we look at level three, I call level three IT support. This is when you send a ticket to, for example, a NOC, an applications group, a data center, for example. On average, those tickets last year in North America were a little over $100. Desktop support tickets were right around $70, but once again, a wide variance around the mean. Some of those were very costly tickets because they had high travel time and high work time. Others were much less expensive than $69. The average fully loaded cost of the service desk ticket last year was about $22, and self-help tickets were about $2 each. Finally, problem management. If you can eliminate a problem from a root cause perspective, that's what problem management is uh, all about, uh, the cost, the marginal cost is zero, and the reality is you're creating value there because you're preventing tickets that would otherwise impact the productivity of the users you support. Now, in last year for the first time, uh, I felt comfortable putting level minus two up on this chart to indicate that there are now technologies, AI technologies, artificial intelligence technologies that enable seek and destroy or search and destroy, meaning that they go out and they look at the endpoints, uh, they look at so level minus two is seek and destroy or search and destroy. Uh, what it means is that artificial intelligence is out there trying to identify problems before they manifest themselves as tickets. And this can be uh, by monitoring endpoint bots for pending failure, for example, printers, hard drives, servers, uh, and the like. Uh, but it can also be anomaly detection. If you're used to getting, say, 100 Outlook calls a day and suddenly you start trending and you see 200, 300, 400 Outlook calls a day, there might be something wrong. Or, for example, after the rollout of Windows 10, uh, you might have gone from you know, 200 Windows calls a day to 1,000 Windows calls a day, just as an example. So we do now have AI technologies that enable this seek and destroy, search and destroy. And it's even better than level minus one because level minus one, uh, the premise there is that you've already got a problem. It's a known problem. It's generating incidents, uh, but we can eliminate it from a root cause perspective. Level minus two says, we want to get there even before it creates a ticket. We want to seek and destroy, search and destroy, and uh, eliminate those from a root cause perspective. 
Now, the economics of shift left are what drives this phenomenon. You can see that as you move a ticket to the left on this spectrum, the cost of resolution goes down. Now, you can't indefinitely move a ticket to the left. Not every ticket is eligible for search and destroy or even problem management level minus one or self-help or even the service staff. There are certain things that need to be done in the field by field support, certain things that need to be done by vendor support. But I think you get the gist of this. To the extent that you can shift tickets to the left, you can reduce your total cost of ownership, sometimes fairly dramatically. So with that in mind, let's take a look at some of the metrics around shift left. And what we want to look at are some common service desk metrics. We've got about 20 metrics shown on page three. In addition to this, we like to promote something called the balance scorecard, which aggregates the most important metrics for a level one service desk. And those would typically include your cost per ticket, customer satisfaction, your first contact resolution rate, uh, your agent utilization. Uh, typically, there would also be a service level metric in there, like percent of calls answered within 60 seconds, for example. And then generally, we like to include analyst job satisfaction in that as well. So that balanced scorecard gives you a single overall view of your performance. But the metrics that are shown on this page are not all inclusive. There are literally hundreds of metrics that I've seen for a level one service desk. Uh, these are the metrics that we at MetricNet would typically use for a benchmark. Uh, and these are the ones that tell us the best story with the least number of metrics. So roughly 20 metrics, they tell us a very interesting story about the service desk, and they are all inclusive in the sense that they are diagnostic and prescriptive. So if we identify a gap in cost of ticket or customer satisfaction or any other metric shown on this page, we can diagnose why that gap exists and hence recommend actions that are necessary to close that gap or mitigate that gap over time. Now, the metrics of shift left at level one. So in a service desk, how do you know if you're being effective at shift left? Well, you look at your first level resolution rate, the percentage of tickets resolved at level one divided by all tickets accepted at level one. And then you have the user self-service completion rate down in the lower right, and then tickets per user per month. So look at the highlighted metrics. Those are the metrics of shift left uh, at level one. Now, there are a secondary set of metrics, meaning that they are not impacted directly by shift left, but they are in, impacted indirectly by shift left. And those would include your cost per ticket, your customer satisfaction, and your ticket handle time. So you can see that we've got six metrics, at the very least, that are impacted by shift left in a level one service desk. Uh, the yellow metrics are the primary ones that are affected by shift left, and then the green metrics are impacted as a result of those primary metrics being affected. So this brings us to our first polling question today, and I'm going to ask Lisa if she'd open the polling question up. And the question is, uh, would you like to receive a copy of the KPIs ebook? This is an ebook that MetricNet put together for service desk key performance indicators. There are uh, roughly 40 key performance indicators included in this book. We define each metric. We explain why the metric is important. Uh, we talk about some cause and effect relationships uh, for that metric. Uh, so if you're interested, it's a free resource. You can download that. It's in PDF format. And it's a good uh, desktop reference or virtual desktop reference that you can use whenever you're wondering about the definition of a particular metric. So, if you're interested in that, uh, please weigh in on that. We'll make sure that we get you a copy of the intro to service desk key performance indicators. Okay, let's go ahead and move on now. Uh, let's talk about the shift left metrics I've just discussed. The primary metrics of shift left are your first level resolution rate, user self-service completion rate, and the tickets per user per month. The secondary metrics of shift left include your cost per ticket, customer satisfaction, and ticket handle time. Now, how are these metrics impacted by shift left? The arrows in the right-hand column answer that question for you. If you're shifting left, your first level resolution rate goes up because you're taking tickets from desktop support and field services and vendor support and level three IT, and they're moving those to level one when possible. And so your level one resolution rate increases. Self-service completion rate increases. Think self-help, self-service, automated password resets, FAQs, questions about Microsoft Windows, Microsoft Office. Those are classic types of incidents that are resolved in self-help, self-service. 
and then tickets per user per month go down. Why would that be? Because as you go to level minus one and level minus two, you're eliminating tickets from a root cause perspective at level minus one. At level minus two, you're preventing tickets altogether. So your tickets per user per month goes down. Oh, secondary metrics are your cost per ticket. Why would that go up? Because what you're shifting to the left are tickets. Like if I'm at level one and you bring a desktop ticket to me or a field services ticket to me, those tend to be more complex. They tend to have a longer handle time. So the cost per ticket goes up. But customer satisfaction also goes up because the customer gets resolution more quickly when they can get it done at level one or through self-help or best of all, they never experience the problem uh, at all. Ticket handle time also goes up for the same reason I just mentioned, cost per ticket goes up due to an increase in handle time. So if I'm at a level one service desk, or even in desktop support, and I'm taking tickets from the right, like field services or vendor support or level three IT, those are more complex tickets. They have a longer handle time, hence the cost per ticket goes up. But that's okay, because you're taking a $70 ticket at desktop support and turning it into a $22 ticket at level one, or you're taking a $700 ticket, $600 ticket, at vendor support and turning it into a $69 ticket at desktop support. So it's okay if your cost per ticket goes up, as long as your TCO, total cost of ownership, goes down. TCO is just the sum of the cost of support at every level in the organization. So you add up the cost of support at self-help, level one, uh, it's level one service desk, desktop support, level three, I, level, uh, three IT, uh, field support, and vendor support. You add all that up, and that's your total cost of ownership. As you're shifting left, you might see the cost per ticket go up at any given level, but the bigger picture is that your total cost of ownership is going down. That's what shift left does for you, and that's the big economic incentive uh, for shift left. So let's take a look now at some desktop support metrics. We've organized those into seven categories. Uh, we've got cost and service level metrics. We've got productivity and quality metrics, ticket handling, technician, and workload metrics. And then once again, we advocate for the creation of a balanced scorecard because that balanced scorecard gives you a single overall measure of your performance. Once again, very similar set of metrics. You include in your scorecard your cost per ticket, customer satisfaction, uh, your first contact resolution rate, your agent utilization, your agent job satisfaction, uh, and it gives you that overall view of your performance. These are among the most common desktop support metrics, but once again, it's not every desktop support metric I've ever seen. That would number in the hundreds. But these are the desktop metrics that we use when we're conducting a desktop support benchmark. Let's look at the metrics that are impacted by shift left in desktop. One of them is called percent resolved level one capable. Now that sounds complicated, but it's pretty straightforward. If I handle a uh, thousand tickets a month at desktop support, and I later audit those 1,000 tickets, you know, do a sample of those tickets, and I discover that I probably, you know, uh, 100 of those could have been resolved at level one. My percent resolved level one capable is 100 tickets that are resolvable at level one divided by 1,000 total tickets taken by desktop support. So my percent resolved level one capable is 10%. The industry average on that metric, by the way, is about 20%. Ticket handling metrics are impacted by shift left at the desktop. So your incident and service request work time, as you shift tickets to the left, same concept with the level one service desk, you're taking a more complex ticket from the right of the spectrum and moving it to the left. So you take a field service ticket, turn it into a desktop ticket, or a vendor ticket, and turn it into a desktop ticket, or a level three IT ticket and turn it into a desktop ticket. The work time and the uh, for both incidents and service requests tends to be longer. Now, in terms of workload, your tickets per user or per seat per month, including incidents and service requests, will go down. Why? Because as you can shift left, things fall off the left-hand side, either through level minus one support, meaning root cause analysis or problem management, or seek and destroy. You're, as you're shifting left, eventually some of those tickets, let me go back a couple slides to make this point, as you shift left far enough, eventually some of those tickets are gonna fall off the left-hand side. They're gonna end up in problem management, eliminated from a root cause perspective, or they will be prevented through search and destroy or seek and destroy. And so it's important to recognize that the workload will decrease at the desktop level, same thing with level one, as you're shifting to the left. So that's a good thing because that's where your reduction in total cost of ownership comes from. Now the secondary metrics, meaning that they are impacted by shift left, but they are impacted only indirectly through things like work time. So work time has a big impact on cost per ticket. So we would expect cost per ticket to change as a result of shift left. 
cost per incident, cost per service request. Those are the two components of cost per ticket. Customer satisfaction is indirectly impacted by shift left at the desktop. And then your MTTR for incidents and service requests is also going to be impacted. So we've got the primary metrics that are impacted by shift left at the desktop, highlighted in yellow, highlighted in green, are the, metro, the secondary metrics impacted at the desktop by shift left. How are they impacted? The right-hand column here shows the effect of shift left. So percent resolve level one capable, that number should go down because you don't want to be resolving something at desktop support that could be resolved at level one or especially through self-help, self-service. So you want that number, percent resolve level one capable to be as low as possible. Um, the industry average is around 20%. If you're really good, you're going to get that number down to about 5%. Nobody ever gets that number to zero, but uh, percent resolved level one capable is considered a TCO, total cost of ownership metric. You want it to be as low as possible, just as you want first level resolution rate in the service desk to be as high as possible. Ticket work time also goes up for the same reasons we mentioned in the level one service desk. You're taking a more complex ticket to the right and you're shifting it to the left, so the work time tends to increase. The tickets per seat per month will actually go down for the same reason that tickets per user per month go down at the level one service desk. If you keep pushing to the left, they eventually fall off into level minus one at a prevention or level minus two, seek and destroy. Cost per ticket will go up for the same reason it does with the service desk. You're taking complex tickets and you're moving them to the left to level one support or desktop support. The work time is longer, so the cost per ticket goes up. The customer satisfaction goes up because customers are getting quicker resolution on those tickets and your MTTR sometimes will go up as well. That's not a bad thing. Overall, what we're looking for is global optimization. So sometimes that means your cost per ticket at any given level goes up. Sometimes that means your MTTR might go up because you're handling a more complex ticket set that's being shifted to the left. But in the aggregate, what we're doing is reducing TCO and improving the customer experience. So let's take a look at an insurance industry case study uh, this was an insurance company that Metric Net worked with over the course of a year. And I'm showing all the shift left metrics at level one as well as desktop support. I designated them primary and secondary shift left metrics, as you can see. We've already discussed all the metrics shown in the two columns in the far left. What I'm showing in the two columns on the far right is their performance at the beginning of this initiative to shift left. And then one year later, what did the metric look like? First level resolution rate went from 67 to almost 84%, huge improvement there. The self-service completion rate went from 3% to more than 11%. That's a good thing. Self-service tickets have no marginal additional cost. Um, there, there is a fixed cost associated with the technology for doing self-help, self-service, but that gets amortized over the number of tickets that you drive through that channel. So they're really, a lot of people think of it as a, and you know, it's an agentless ticket. So there's no agent costs associated with those self-help, self-service tickets. And growing that from 3% to 11% is huge. Tickets per user per month, look at how those decrease from almost two tickets to down to around one ticket. That's where you get the massive reduction in TCO by shifting left. Eventually, remember, tickets fall off the left-hand side. They end up at level minus one or level minus two. Cost per ticket at level one went up. That's okay though, because total cost of ownership did go down. And we're going to see that in just a moment where I show you what the TCO calculation looks like. CSAT went from just under 80% to more than 92%, almost 93%. And the handle time went up from 7.62 to 8.92 minutes. What we're looking for here is global optimization. So it's okay if the cost per ticket goes up at level one. And it's okay if the handle time goes up at level one if total cost of ownership goes down. And what you're going to see in just a moment is that the total cost of ownership not only went down, it went down by a massive amount, by about $37 million. You'll, you'll see that in just a moment. Let's look at our desktop support shift left metrics. Percent resolved level one capable at the beginning of this insurance industry initiative to shift left was around 23%. That's a high number, it's higher than average. They got it down to 7.2% within one year. So 7% roughly of the tickets resolved at desktop support could have and should have been resolved at level one, but that's a whole lot better than 23% of those tickets uh, that could have and should have been resolved at level one. The ticket work time increased from about 35 minutes to 39 minutes. Tickets per seat per month dropped pretty dramatically from a half a ticket per seat per month to 0.3 tickets per seat per month. Ticket costs went up from $72 to $90. 
Customer satisfaction went up from 84% to 91% because they're getting better resolution and the shift left, you know, getting it resolved at level one when possible. And finally, the MTTR, it went up. And I mentioned that sometimes when you're looking to globally optimize something, you are gonna have a metric move in the direction that you think is the wrong way. It's counterintuitive that the cost per ticket goes up and that the MTTR goes up. But if we get a better global outcome, that's what global optimization is all about. We're not about optimizing cost per ticket at any given level or MTTR at any given level. What we're about is optimizing the global support system and end support, minimizing the total cost of ownership while at the same time maximizing the quality of the customer experience. So from this same insurance industry case study, let me show you what happened to their total cost of ownership. So down below, what we're showing are the TCL metrics before and after, as before they started their shift left initiative, and then one year later, what happened? Okay, they started with 68,000 end users. A year later, they had about 72,000 end users. This is a big company, big insurance company. You would know the name. At level minus two, Seek and Destroy, they didn't have any tickets uh, that were resolved through Seek and Destroy um, prior to their shift left initiative. A year later, they were eliminating approximately 4,700 tickets that never impacted the user through Seek and Destroy. Level minus one, they had no level minus one, they had no self-help portal. At the beginning of this initiative, you can see a year later, they were driving about 3,600 tickets a month through that portal. You can see that level zero, I'm, excuse me, I misspoke. Level minus one is problem management, root cause analysis. 30, zero tickets a year ago when they started, 3,600 tickets being resolved through problem management, eliminated through problem management uh, a year later. At level zero, they didn't have a lot of volume going through self-help, about 1,982 tickets per month. A year later, over 8,000 tickets a month. You can see at level one, they went from 130,000 tickets to 73,000 tickets. Well, you can see the numbers here, but also you'll notice that we've shown annual TCO at each level. Uh, going across to the right. But the number that really matters is when we go to the far right-hand column, before they started their shift left initiative, they were handling 190,000 tickets a month. The average cost per ticket across all levels of support was around $51, and the total cost of ownership was about $116 million. A year later, their average monthly ticket volume, despite the fact that their end user population went up, they were down to 116,000 tickets a month, Average cost per ticket, $57, it did go up. Look at the total cost of ownership. When we added up across all support levels, they were down to $79 million. That's an enormous $37 million savings. Not everybody gets that much savings. This obviously was a large organization. They had a huge scale, but this is the potential of shift left if you've not done it before. The potential to reduce your total cost of ownership the potential to get the right ticket to the right person at the right place at the right time, the potential to maximize first level and first contact resolution rate, the potential to drive volume into self-help, self-service, to eliminate tickets through problem management and to prevent tickets altogether through seek and destroy or search and destroy. So what did we learn from this insurance company? Well, establishing performance targets for every TCL metric is a good thing. You want to have a target to shoot for if you're serious about shifting left. They also did what is called goal-based training. They said, for example, we want to improve our first level resolution rate from 80% to 90%. So let's train around that specific goal. You know, it wasn't a huge amount of training. It was about 18 hours per analyst. They said, we want to hit this goal of a 90% FLR, first level resolution rate. Let's train to achieve that goal. They established formal knowledge and problem management disciplines, which they didn't have before. Those are two of the idle process practices. There's now 34 idle practices in idle four, in idle three, there were 26 idle processes. So it became more complex, but uh, problem incident knowledge management, in my opinion, are the, the big three. Those are where you get the 80% of the value. If you're looking for the 80-20 rule around idle, I would focus on problem incident knowledge management. They also deflected tickets into a self-help portal. You saw that on the TCO calculation on the table on the prior page. And significantly, they adopted an AI tool artificial intelligence tool that did have level minus two seek and destroy capabilities. It automated their problem management and automatically updated their knowledge base over time. These are two problematic idle areas. Many of our clients have difficulty maturing problem management, maturing knowledge management and problem management. 
and then they automatically categorized and routed tickets. This is a big problem in the industry. You know that the other category ends up usually being one of the top three when you're putting a label on a ticket. Uh, this particular AI tool allowed them to automatically categorize and, and route tickets. So that's the quick overview on total cost of ownership. I want to and, and shift left. What I want to do now is shift gears a little bit and share some knowledge with you because we're going to give you an opportunity to uh, receive a report called the ITSM Intelligence Report, just completed late last year by MetricNet. So I'm jumping ahead a few slides, but let me go back and share with you some of uh, some of what we learned in doing the research for this report. So tribal knowledge, you know what that is. It's knowledge that's stored in the heads of the individuals that work in service and support, but hasn't been recorded anywhere. It's not in the knowledge base. It's not documented anywhere. So when we ask the question, do you have a substantial amount of knowledge? It's not currently in the knowledge base. Um, out of 217 respondents, 20% strongly agreed with that statement and another 45% agreed with it. So 65%, two thirds, say that tribal knowledge uh, is a problem. So the ability to capture knowledge, especially automatically, uh, is huge. And we're now starting to see in the industry AI tools that allow that capability, that read the free, uh, that have NLP natural language processing and read the free form text fields in the ticket and can help uh, identify knowledge and update knowledge articles, purge obsolete knowledge articles, create new knowledge articles. Let's take a look at the front line, which uh, for the first time in 2020, front line meaning those that are customer facing, whether at level one or desktop support or field services, uh, they're not afraid of AI anymore, which is, this is the first time that's happened. And there's a couple reasons for this. Um, one is that uh, I think the, the, the best performers in IT services support recognize that they're always gonna be ahead of the curve as far as AI goes. And so they're always going to be a scarce commodity in this industry, meaning that they are always going to be able to handle more complex incidents and service requests than the AI will. And, and that will be true for some time to come. Now, the analogy I like to use is that if we look at the auto industry back in, you know, when there were the big three, General Motors, Ford, and Chrysler in the 1960s, um, manufacturing in auto was a very labor intensive industry. And if you looked at an assembly line, there would be thousands of workers on an assembly line that were turning wrenches and putting tires on and installing seats and dashboards and aligning hoods and body panels. Uh, now, you don't have those people working on the assembly line. You have, you have robots that do the welding, that do the painting, that do the uh, actual assembly, you know, turning the nuts and bolts and putting the wheels on and installing the dashboard. Uh, that's all done automatically. Uh, and those that are working on the front line are now engineers behind safety glass that are looking at computers and are looking to ensure that they remain within uh, statistical uh, tolerance levels on you know, body alignment and paint thickness and reflectivity and things like that. So the assembly line uh, laborer has become an assembly line engineer. Uh, it's a much higher skill position, better paid position, a uh, position that requires a huge amount of training. And the best performers in IT service and support recognize that AI is going to do the same thing in the ITSM industry that it did for the auto industry, meaning that at first AI is going to handle commodity things like password resets, Microsoft Office, Windows, FAQs, things like that. Um, and what this is going to do is allow uh, the personnel, the technicians that work in desktop support, field services, and level one support to achieve their full potential and work on more complex problems, more complex issues. But if you look at the number of uh, support personnel that agree with this statement, my organization would benefit from AI powered problem detection and resolution, 21% strongly agree and 42% agree. So again, we're close to two thirds with 63% that agree with that statement. They believe that they would benefit from AI. So the fear that historically has accompanied artificial intelligence, you know, the fear being that I'm not gonna have a job if we get AI to start solving these problems, uh, that fear doesn't exist anymore, uh, which is a good thing. What it means is that the industry is not only ready to accept AI, but the technology is now mature to the point where we have uh, AI tools that um, actually learn from themselves, so-called machine learning, and they engage in natural language processing, they engage in automatic ticket routing or intelligent ticket routing. Uh, they do um, uh, process, um, business process mining and a variety of other things. But the key thing is that they get smarter over time. They, they actually uh, improve through machine learning. 
Uh, they're also not afraid of automation. Automation, AI, not the same thing, uh, but when we ask the question, my organization will benefit from automatic ticket categorization, 25% agree, strongly agree, and another 44% agree, that's 69%. Think about that. This has been a problem in the industry for as long as I've been in the industry, you know, three decades, uh, is the idea of creating labels on tickets that mean something that you can do root cause analysis with. And we all know that the so-called other category almost always ends up in the top three and the ticket categorization is imperfect at best. And in fact, it's, it's actually pretty bad in most cases, uh, but some of these AI tools that exist out there are now very good at reading free form text and also looking at um, the actual formatted uh, part of the ticket and determining what the actual driver is. So something that says Windows ticket might actually be, be VP token lock, um, um, the VPN token lock, sorry. Um, a ticket that says password reset might actually be something really different than a password reset. It might be a permission issue. Um, so uh, a good uh, tool can actually recategorize tickets and create meaningful categories that can be used for problem management and uh, root cause analysis. When we asked about a wish list, and again, you're going to have a chance to uh, get a free copy of this report. Uh, when we asked, um, you know, those who were involved in this, 217 people, you know, from the front line, you know, what's your wish list? Number one on the list, we'd like AI and machine learning. We'd like to see some artificial intelligence to help us. Because uh, if one thing we've learned through the pandemic is that ticket volumes are up by about 35% across the board, uh, but head counts not up at all. So uh, it, it take an impossible job from 2019 and turn it into a doubly impossible job in 2020 because of increasing ticket volumes uh, due to, you know, people working from home, people having, um, you know, connectivity issues, all sorts of things, but volume is up by 35%, headcount's not up at all. Communication and change management, 18%, uh, put that high on their list of, of, you know, their wish list from the front line. Uh, better knowledge and self-service, 13%. So you can see this wish list here when we asked them, you know, if you could have anything you wanted or make any changes you'd like to make in IT services support, what would be number one on your wish list? The number one turned out to be AI, artificial intelligence, and machine learning, meaning AI that gets smarter uh, over time. So this brings us to our second polling question, and I've already, you know, kind of teased this. Uh, so uh, we're going to open this polling question and it simply ask you, do you want to get a copy of this uh, ITSM intelligence report? Uh, there's no charge for it, of course. Uh, it's more than uh, 60 pages. We've got uh, 200, more than 200 respondents, four core topic areas, um, and I've just shown you those four core topic areas. And then we've got 80, more than 80 verbatim quotes in there. So if you'd like to see what the state of the industry was in 2020, the ITSM intelligence report will uh, answer those questions for you. So let me review what we've discussed today, the economics of shift left and the metrics of shift left. Um, although this slide is entitled the economics of shift left, the economics of shift left are what drive the metrics of shift left. So the economics here show the fully loaded cost of resolving a ticket at different levels in the organization. And if you can take a vendor ticket and turn it into a field service ticket, or take a field support ticket and turn it into a desktop ticket, or a desktop ticket, and turn it into a service desk ticket. And by the way, a lot of shift left is happening during 2020 out of necessity because not as much desktop support was going on during the pandemic, not as much field support was going on during the pandemic. So level one had to get really creative about how they could resolve remotely as many tickets as possible. Now we do know that some tickets can't be resolved remotely. They're gonna require hardware swap, for example, and many large companies have set up depots. You can drive to the headquarters building or you can drive to a nearby office and you can swap out your computer or a keyboard or whatever the, the, the equipment is. In some cases, they will send a technician to your house if you're an at-home worker. And in some cases, some of you are still working uh, from offices, but there's been a sea change in the nature of the working environment that has been particularly uh, noticeable, part particularly um, disruptive, I would say, in IT service and support. And so we've seen a lot of shift left just out of necessity over the last year during the pandemic. 
But what we're summarizing here is the fully loaded cost of a ticket at different levels of the organization. And clearly, if you can move a ticket to the left on this uh, spectrum without sacrificing customer experience, uh, you decrease the cost per ticket and eventually decrease total cost of ownership because you're pushing tickets off to the left-hand side. So those are the economics of shift left. The metrics of shift left, I've summarized for you at level one. Let's just go back and look at those uh, real quickly. Uh, for level one support, they are first level resolution, which improves. They are user self-service, which improves. Tickets per user per month, which decreases. Cost per ticket may go up, but that's okay if TCO is going down. Customer satisfaction improves, and ticket handle time also goes up because you're taking a more complex ticket from the right, shifting it to the left. Longer handle time <clears throat> also means higher cost per ticket. Let's talk about the ship left metrics at level two. Primary metrics are percent resolved, level one capable, meaning the percent of tickets resolved at desktop that could have been, should have been resolved at level one. Work time tends to go up because again, taking a more complex ticket to the right, moving it to the left, tickets per seat per month goes down because eventually we push those tickets off the left-hand side. Cost per ticket increases, that's okay, as long as our TCO goes down. Customer satisfaction improves and mean time to resolve sometimes goes up and we saw in the insurance industry case study that that was the case. The MTTR went from 9.5 hours to 10.8 hours. So that's a quick run through of the metrics of shift left, the importance of shift left, the power of shift left in helping you reduce total cost of ownership and deliver a higher quality customer experience. So what we say at MetricNet is that there are two foundation metrics. One is total cost of ownership, the other one is customer satisfaction. And if you're moving the needle on both of those, you're reducing your TCO while at the same time improving your customer experience, that's a win for everybody. Shift Left does that for you. If you've never engaged in a Shift Left initiative, if you've never thought seriously about this, I would encourage you to take a close look at Shift Left because there's great power here to reduce your total cost of ownership and deliver a higher quality customer experience. So let me see if we've got any questions here. And um, I don't know if I'll Jeff, be able to... Yeah. Uh, oh, I don't know. Can it, I'm so sorry to everyone. Let me just say that the, the GoTo suite has gone through an upgrade and that's part of what caused our issue this morning. Can you see the um, questions? Yeah. Oh, we don't actually have any questions other than the ones that we originally received from the registration. So let me start taking you through those, Jeff. And then you guys, you've you've got Jeff for another 19 minutes. Um, mm -hmm. So any questions that you have, please throw into um, the chat and we'll get those uh, covered as well. So the first question <clears throat> is from Gail. And um, Gail is very exciting for Gail because she is working at an organization where they are just starting um, adopting and adapting IDLE and ITSM best practices. So her question, I'm just looking for ideas or tricks, tips to help ease the resistance resistance from new people who are about to start adopting IDLE slash ITSM best practices for service management. Any ideas that you may have? Thank you. Yeah, you know, there, there's resistance to some change, um, but there's an embrace of other types of change. And generally training, whether it's I, ITSM best practices, uh, idle training, is perceived as a positive thing. So we know from having done thousands of benchmarks that there are known drivers of employee job satisfaction, and they are uh, training, coaching, and career pathing. And if agents feel that you are investing in their future by giving them sufficient training and quality training and you're coaching them effectively and they've got a real bona fide documented career path, uh, you can maximize job satisfaction that way. That in turn reduces absenteeism and turnover, both of which are very costly within a support organization. So I, I, the question is interesting to me because I typically don't hear resistance to training opportunities. You know, if you're going to get trained at an idle basic level or at a higher level, you're going to get trained in ITSM best practices. That's normally overwhelmingly seen as a positive thing uh, because uh, people want to improve their skill sets. They want to become better at what they do uh, and they want to know that they are valued within the organization. And one way to demonstrate that they are valued is to offer training, coaching, uh, and career pathing. So 
to the extent that you receive resistance, um, I would just based on my experience say that that's probably coming from people that have gotten too comfortable in their jobs and they just don't want any change, or maybe people that have been there too long uh, and need to turn over. And I'm not suggesting you can, I'm just saying, you know, complacency sets in when somebody's been at a, you know, we sometimes do benchmarks and find that people have been, you know, doing, you know, service desk or desktop work for 10, 15, 20, 25 years. And you grow stale over time, you grow complacent over time. And sometimes that's where the resistance comes from or people that have gotten really comfortable in their jobs and they just don't wanna hear about training, they don't wanna hear about best practices, they wanna keep doing things the way they always have. They may be nearing retirement, they may have just gotten really comfortable in the job or they're just not you know, interested in improving their skill set as a tech support professional. So my hope would be that the resistance to what you're talking about, training in idle and ITSM best practices, would come from a limited number of people or, or none whatsoever. Uh, your best performers are going to embrace this uh, as they should. Right. Um, this is a great opportunity for them. Right, and I also will just say that the um, ITSMprofessor.com, which is a blog that we've run for 16 years, there's a lot of resource on here in that topic. And Jeff, boy, have the questions come rolling in. So buckle up. <laughs> um, there's two questions around ROI and, and uh, TCO. So I'd kind of like to put them together if that makes sense for you. So sort of the first part, how is the ROI of shift left measured? And then does the $2 TCO for self-help take into account the customer's time spent solving the issue? And that's from Tom. So maybe if we could take Tom's question specific to the deck first. Yeah, the, the $2 cost does not take into account the customer time. Uh, so it's a good point because the $2 represents the cost of the organization for creating the technology through which uh, you know, tickets get resolved through self-help. Now, the more volume you drive through that channel, you can drive that cost down to 50 cents or a dollar per ticket. Um, or if you have light volume in that channel, it might be, you know, three, four dollars a ticket. Uh, but Tom brings up a good point, which is that you don't want a user spending too much time in a self-help portal because uh, their time is valuable. And if you have users that are spending 30 minutes, 40 minutes, an hour in a self-help portal, that's a waste of time. They should be calling the formal source of support. They should be um, filing a ticket or calling or chatting or uh, getting support from a professional. So the rule of thumb that we use, Tom, is that an end user shouldn't be spending more than 10 minutes at a time in a self-help portal because beyond that, on average, they're gonna be consuming more resources than they're saving. So self-help, self-service, is great for simple things. Password resets, Microsoft Office, FAQs, Microsoft Windows, some of the really basic stuff. Um, but when it becomes more complex, longer handle times, you know, proprietary business applications and infrastructure, you don't want a user spending a lot of time in the self-help portal and they should be contacting uh, the formal source of support. But users like channel choice. They like having a choice between chat, voice, walk up, uh, web submit, email, and self-help, self-service. Uh, but you know, for those users that are tempted to spend a lot of time in the self-help portal, they're not doing anybody any favors. So the $2 does not take into account the user's uh, productive time. And uh, the second part of that is that you don't want a user spending a whole lot of time in self-help, self-service because they're not saving the organization any money when they do that. Now, there was a second question. Could you read that again, Lisa? Yes, Jeff, um, and I'm kind of trying to prioritize for you because we do really have a lot of questions, particularly a lot of questions around the um, around the AI and search and destroy, just so you know. But this question is, how is the ROI of shift left measured? Okay, so um, I, I'm gonna try and give briefer answers because I'd, I'd like to, if possible, get to all of the questions in the next 13 minutes. Um, the ROI of shift left uh, would look at uh, the R means return, I means investment, it's a ratio, the numerator is return, the denominator is investment. So the ROI of shift left would look at the amount of time and energy and the associated cost associated with this shift left. So let's go back to our case study with the insurance company. Uh, they spent uh, time and effort shifting left. Um, and to be honest with you, I don't know what the monetized value of that time and effort was. But we do know what the R was, the return was $37 million. Through shifting left, they reduced their TCO by $37 million. 
They, I know for a fact they didn't spend $37 million getting that return. So let me just make up a number. And again, uh, I don't know what the true number was because I, I don't think they tracked the labor effectively, the headcount that was involved in the shift left initiative, but let me make up a number and, and let's just say it was an outrageous $5 million. And it, that would be an outrageous number. I don't think they spent anywhere near that. Uh, if I had to guess, I'd say it was probably somewhere between a million and $2 million. But let's just say for the sake of the argument that it was $5 million. We got a $36 million return in reduction in TCO, our numerator, divided by $5 million of effort to get that $37 million return. Okay, that's a 700% ROI, meaning a 7x return on investment. So the way you measure ROI in uh, shift left is what are you saving through shift left? That becomes your numerator, your return. And how much did it cost you to get that? What did you have to pay in technology, time, effort, consultants, whatever it was to get that $37 million in savings at the insurance company? And again, I made up the outrageous number of 5 million because I know it was nowhere near that. It was significantly less than that. Um, but even at $5 million, the ROI is huge. You've got a $37 million savings on a $5 million effort, which is 700%, 7x uh, ROI. So that's how I would look at ROI on shift left. That's a great answer. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, so this one is from Vicki up there in Tampa. Uh, good morning. Can you provide examples of automating problem management? You mentioned AI. Ideas on how to get this started. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, there are... Most of what passes for AI in this industry is not really AI, it's um, a rules-based uh, stuff. So some of the common, you know, Watson and some of those tools, uh, they read knowledge and they will chat with you and they will uh, in sometimes synthesize voice and, you know, they'll do, there will be a voice bot, there will be a chat bot built on top of this tool that reads knowledge articles, but it, but it tends to be rules-based. So a lot of what passes for uh, AI in this industry is not really AI, it's rules-based. Uh, the difference being that a, artificial intelligence isn't based on human rules. Artificial intelligence comes up with its own construct for what the environment looks like, what's driving the contact volume, uh, how to wrap tickets intelligently, um, how to shift left over time, and how to do problem management. Um, effective AI will actually look at recurring problems, and by clustering, that is common tickets, it will realize that all these tickets that say token lock or windows are really to VPN token lock tickets. And all these tickets that say uh, bank statement are really you know, hardware issues. Uh, just as an example, by categorizing tickets properly, you can do actual problem, uh, uh, problem management. And we are starting to see examples of automated problem management now through AI tools that are powered by machine learning. So I wanted to make a distinction between so-called AI tools that are really just rules-based tools. So that's not true AI. True AI is uh, not rules-based. It makes up, it develops its own rules over time based on experience. It learns from itself. It gets smarter over time. It also reduces your TCO, it shifts labs, it automates problem management if it's an effective uh, tool. So the way it automates problem management is that it finds, it does what's called clustering. It looks at the free form fields in the ticket, the NL through natural language processing, and it looks at the formatted fields in the ticket, and it looks for connections. It looks for common phrases, for example. And oftentimes what is, you know, what you might categorize in Remedy or ShareWell or ServiceNow or any other ticketing tool, the way they're categorized, an AI tool will categorize things very, very differently in an effort to get out root causes so that it can automate problem management. Now, problem management is the discipline, the idle discipline of looking at root causes of known problems. So a known problem is something that you know is generating incidents uh, in the environment. Uh, an effective AI tool is going to get at those root causes and eliminate them, sometimes automatically, sometimes by creating an alert that lets somebody else in IT correct uh, the problem because oftentimes a problem will be driven by multiple root causes. Uh, AI can sometimes resolve them automatically. AI, uh, if it can't resolve them automatically, it can create an alert for somebody in IT that says, this is why you keep getting this particular uh, incident. So if you've got 10,000 incidents uh, attached to a known problem, um, it, first of all, it's not unusual in a large enterprise to have tens of thousands of known problems. Uh, you're never going to get that number down to zero. Um, you focus on those that are generating 80% of your volume. So you would look at what's called incident velocity, which is uh, the 
number of months that the problem uh, or the number of incidents associated with a known problem and you divide that by the number of months that the problem has been out there and that gives you your, your problem velocity. You work on the high velocity problems because of those having the most impact on your users. An intelligent AI tool that learns through machine learning automatically does that. It looks at the problems that are driving the most volume. It gets to root causes, corrects them when it can, or creates an alert uh, if there's some manual intervention uh, required. That's, that's really interesting because high velocity, you know, I'm so glad to see that really coming to the forefront of, of things that people are talking about and education that's available um, because they think, you know, it's a, it's a key success factor or differentiator for a lot of organizations. Anyway, another question um, is, which I love this question. Thank you so much. Who is driving the AI machine learning initiatives that you're seeing in conjunction with Shift Left, and how are organizations handling the associated upskilling of their staff? Um, AI initiatives are generally driven uh, at an executive level, uh, CIO or direct report to a CIO. Um, you know, these are labor intensive functions. 70% of your cost and support, whether it's level one support or desktop support, are human resources. Uh, so they are very labor intensive. Uh, AI um, uh, is, uh, a AI is a replacement for labor, not for all labor, but you know, for the commodity type stuff, for example. Uh, and eventually it will get smarter and smarter and you know, resolve problems that are unique to a vertical market that are, will resolve problems that are unique to the infrastructure of a company or unique to the business applications uh, of an organization. So CIOs are very motivated by three tactical measures, better, faster, cheaper. So better means higher quality transactions with the customers. Faster means quicker resolution times. Cheaper means lower total uh, cost of ownership when it comes to service and support. So the AI initiatives tend to be sponsored by executives who are you know, driven by bottom line, particularly during COVID. As I mentioned, ticket volumes were up by 35%, but headcount's not up. Uh, so the job that was difficult in 2019 has become virtually impossible in 2020 because you have uh, a dramatically increased workload with typically not much of an increase or any increase whatsoever in human resources. Uh, AI reached an inflection point last year where it started to take off in terms of adoption in large part because companies had no choice. If your volume's up 35%, your ticket volume's up 35%, and your headcount remains flat, you gotta you gotta get creative and you gotta find solutions. Um, and AI has stepped into that void in, in a big way in 2020, an inflection point to the point where we're starting to see a rapid adoption in machine learning powered AI tools uh, that do automate a problem management, shift left, reduction in TCO, uh, problem elimination through uh, seek and destroy, uh, and the like. So they tend to be executive sponsored because the executives are the ones that are driven by business results, better, faster, cheaper. Now, the second part of the question, the first part maybe it was upscaling. I'm not sure what that meant because uh, upscaling staff, I don't know what that means because what happens is- when oh, bring... Jeff, I'm gonna interrupt one second to say the word is actually upskilling. Oh, upskilling. Which, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, it's a good question because AI uh, takes away the easy stuff and what's left is, is a more complex problem set at every level in the organization. Okay. Well, some individuals are very good at staying ahead of the game and because they realize it's critical to their uh, career success. And so they stay ahead of the game, they, they read and they study and they take courses and, and they, they stay ahead of the AI. There are others that can be trained to you know, stay ahead of the AI, uh, but there are others um, that probably aren't going to stay ahead of the AI. Um, now, I've never seen AI, I've never seen layoffs as a result of AI. I wanna make that very clear, but I have seen attrition as a result of AI. Um, this is a high turnover industry. Uh, for enterprises, the turnover of tax is about 40% per year at level one, it's about 25% per year in desktop support. Now, if you go to MSPs, managed service providers, the turnover is almost 100% per year. So if AI is displacing personnel, it never results in layoffs. It's just you get attrition and you don't backfill. So yes, there will right. be, is there gonna be a displacement of resources? Not directly, but eventually there will be. And again, it's not from layoffs, it's from attrition and not backfilling because AI is doing some of the commodity stuff. Now the upskilling can happen through, you know, just motivation. I wanna, you know, stay ahead of this. 
or you know formal training um, those that choose not to stay ahead of the curve you know they're taking a big risk because i think it's their responsibility to remain relevant in the industry uh and you know the bots i'll be doing a presentation later this morning on this uh the bots are here you know ai is here uh, and it is going to make a huge impact on ITSM. I gave the auto analogy earlier. That's what I see happening in this industry is that support technicians are going to become support engineers uh, that are directing the AI bots, telling them what to do. And I thought that was a particularly fascinating sl slide. The front line no longer fears AI and those numbers, because I remember what they looked like you know, years ago. Um, so thought it was fascinating. So Jeff D has a great question too. He's asking, how are you measuring customer satisfaction? And I would personally add sort of onto that and employee experience. But Jeff, we're at 11.59. So let me let me do my uh, moment of housekeeping. Um, you guys that are with us in a very large number today. So of course, today's the day we have the technical issue. Again, I really apologize um, for the rocky start. For those of you that have to leave, thanks for being here. As you probably know, because you've been here before, when you log out, it will ask you a couple, um, a very short series of questions. The most important one really being, what ideas do you have? What else do you want to see our webinar presenters talk about? We really do um, use that list to build out our calendar every year. So, you know, we love your ideas and your thoughts. And remember, for those of you that are practitioners on this uh, webinar, what you guys always say, you want to hear practitioners. That's great. We agree. Guess what? You are. So any practitioner who has an idea about something they would like to present, please reach out to me or my team. We would be very happy to help you build that presentation. Then it's even something that you could you know, submit to present at different conferences. So if you've been thinking about doing that for a while and, and you just, uh, you need a little bit of help or a little bit of a push, we're, we're here to help and push. Um, Jeff, we have several more questions. So you good to stay and keep going? Uh, you know, unfortunately not because I've, I've got another webcast. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. It's a two, two webcast day, so, um, but, um, Here's what I, I can do, Lisa. If you want to um, uh, send me those questions, I will answer them in writing. Uh, and if you wouldn't mind um, getting back to the individual who had the question or somehow distributing that to the group, I, I yep. can write out to the question. Uh, absolutely. We can put the script up right on the YouTube channel where we put the recording. Um, so, yeah, and I think all of these are going to be, there's, Lots that you'll be able to group together and, and just kind of uh, write a little follow up for us. So I appreciate you doing that, Jeff. And again, um, man, it was great seeing you. And I really, really enjoyed today. And I learned a lot. Although the first seven minutes while I was having my technology heart attack, I didn't absorb it all. So I actually look forward to going and listen to the beginning part of the recording myself. So uh, yeah, everyone's saying, thanks, Jeff. It was awesome. And people are being nice about my technical issues. So that makes me feel better. You are my peeps and I appreciate you all. So we will see you um, next month, March 18th is our next upcoming webinar. We've got a great speaker and a great topic, but we're running out of time. So we will talk to you guys all soon. Thank you again, everyone. Bye. Lisa, thank you everyone. Bye.